Hello and welcome back to KXAM Plus. I am your host Esmeralda Zamora and today is our space-based show with our KXAM space expert Eric Henriksen. Eric, thanks for joining me. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's not Monday anymore, so it feels a lot better to wake up. I had up. Monday off, so today is my nice. Monday. So if you're feeling distinct Monday energy from me, that's why. That's why. <laughs> Well, it's not my Monday, so I'm happy, cheery, and it's almost the end of the week, for sure. And today we have, <laughs> oh, I believe we have the wrong Oh, yeah, we're definitely up. not talking about that. That's right uh, breaking news from yesterday. Let me fix that while we talk, but let us know what we're going to talk about. Today we're talking about a few major space news. This is a space show. We're not talking about breaking news today, thankfully. <laughs> um, but we are talking about something really cool happening tonight, uh, unrelated to, again, unrelated to that breaking news at the bottom of the screen. We're talking about the Perseid meteor shower, which peaks tonight into tomorrow, so between 12th and 13th in August. This is the one of the biggest meteor showers of the year. And the Perseids is pretty cool because uh, it, it is one of the biggest of the year. It's, it comes around like clockwork. We know it's coming. We know when it's coming. Unfortunately, tonight has some issues when it comes to the meteor shower that we typically don't see. Uh, and it's because we're going to have a hard time seeing what we typically would. Why? <laughs> well, that's because uh, we have a full moon right now, or we just had a full moon. We're kind of on the the waxing, waning, the waning, the waning. side. I always mix those up. The waning side of the full moon. So we're... The full moon happened. We're now entering towards the dark new moon, which means there's a lot of light in the sky. So it's going to make seeing the meteor shower very challenging. So the Perseid meteor shower, what's really cool about it is uh, during the peak, you can see somewhere between like 50 and 100 meteors per hour, wow. depending on where you are. It's up in the I, northern hemisphere. It happens every year. I remember us talking about this um, last year. Last year. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the big showers every year. And it's, uh, it's really cool. We passed through the Swift Tuttle Comet's debris. So this comet last passed through in the 90s and left a debris cloud. And so the Earth moves through, our orbit moves through that around this time of year. You know, within like, it's like within like a two-week period. It hits its peak every year, mm -hmm. uh, you know, early August. And so we're passing through the peak of it right now. Where we're at the densest part of the meteor shower or even where that dust cloud was. And basically a meteor shower happens when the Earth passes through a dust cloud. And a lot of them have left been left behind by comets. This one's the Swift-Tuttle Comet. And... It will come back again. I think it's like 133 years. Am I pulling that number out right? Yeah, I think so. 133 years this thing passes through our solar system. And so we had a re fairly recent to pass through them because of that big debris cloud. Lots of meteors every time we get through the Perseus. It's, it's called that because it looks like it's coming from the Perseus so, uh, constellation. And then, like, those are some photos of the meteor showers. So that's typically what it would look like, but our moonlight right. is going to be covering most yeah, of Yeah, we're at 84% um, moonlight mm -hmm. this year. So that's quite a bit of moonlight in the quite sky. <laughs> and so it's a little hard to see. Now, you'll still see them, some of the brighter ones especially. You're just not going to see the same intensity. The best time to look, and I've, had, I've seen some, like, debate online. Typically, it's right after sunset, you know, the first couple hours after sunset. Skies, the twilight allows you to see it, you know, meteors and stars a pretty easily. Clearer. Yeah, yeah, a little clearer, clearer. Unfortunately, the moon's also up. So there has been some debate online if you should look at them early in the morning as like, you know, bright and early tomorrow morning as opposed to tonight. So that's kind of one of the big debate points. When should you look at it? Uh, I'm tempted to say start, try it tonight. If you don't see any, then maybe tomorrow morning when the moon's coming in the right, right spot. Uh, another positive, though, is this, it doesn't just like stop and over we have a couple more days less meteors in the sky and but it's going to fade closer to the 15th which stays 12th it's 12 13 14 friday friday evening that's kind of like the tail end of when you'll be able to see these and luckily the moon's going to be kind of closer to a new moon at that point so throughout the week as you watch not not the peak you're not going to get those meteors every hour like you typically do during the peak but you'll still see them in the sky so keep your eyes up keep looking clear skies pretty much all week right so that's a good sign. There were a couple clouds I saw on the drive-in this morning, but we're supposed to have pretty clear skies this week. Hopefully throughout the night. And hopefully throughout the night. Yeah, so it's going to be a pretty clear week, pretty easy except for the moonlight. So if you can get around the moonlight, you know, if you can... If you have a telescope, if you have send a telescope, us pictures. <laughs> send us photos. The bright ones you'll be able to see because you have these big fireballs sometimes where a larger rock passes into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And a meteor is created, basically a piece of dust hits the atmosphere and just disintegrates. And we get to see that fire trail as it disintegrates, which is pretty cool. It kind of looks like a shooting star, but- It is a shooting star. It is? It 100% is a shooting star. Yeah, wow. that's, where, that's where it comes from. 
Yeah. I think I've seen one in my lifetime. Have you ever seen one? I have seen a few, not during the meteor showers. I usually miss them for some reason. Just randomly? Well, and also, like, for years now, I've worked early mornings, so I have to go to bed before the night even comes. That's true. Especially in the summer, so I'm, like, in bed at 8. You know, late, these days, I kind of come in a little later, so I might get a chance tonight. But, again, the sun's, or the sun, the moon's going to be out, and it's going to be pretty bright. So if you do see one, pretty cool. Uh, the best way to take a photo of them this has been a while since I've talked about this, is to do like a, a old school camera with a long exposure because then you'll get that trail of light oh, as cool. opposed to just a quick flash. So you won't just see the star, but you'll see the tail. that Right. Comes so you have to do a long exposure. For photographers, you know what I mean by that. <laughs> uh, for everybody else, uh, yeah, good luck. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it. it. takes a little <laughs> special equipment to see them, but you can see it with the naked eye. It's amazing what the naked eye can see with the cameras. We just can't quite mimic just yet. Yeah. Um, so this is happening tonight, the meteor yes. shower, and this is something that happens frequently or every year, once a year. Once a year, there are several meteor showers. This is the Persia. There's also the Geminid, which is later this year. Uh, so there's quite a few. We kind of rotate through. I think Geminid. I did see it was going to have a little. I think we have a new moon. New moon when that's going to be, and that's in December. So uh, we'll have a much better chance of seeing those. Percy, it's, it's the biggest meteor shower. You see the most meteors Longest. with this meteor shower. Yeah. As well. I just, yeah, it's just one, well, same length of time, but you're going to have just so many more. It'll be easier to see. Nice. It's a, bi it's a big dust cloud. I do wonder, I actually haven't asked any scientists about this, as we travel through the solar system over, over the next few decades and, we, and the cloud gets more and more dispersed, yeah. are these meteor showers going to decrease in intensity the closer we get to the next time the comet comes in, which is... Oh, quick math, uh, 2120, somewhere in there, 2126, 20? I think. I think that's pretty good math. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, I'm throwing <laughs> it out there. I'll let me, I'll do the math here. You don't have to do the math right now. But yeah, uh, in 100 years or so, that'll be the next chance the comet comes through. And so I wonder, the closer we get to that, will these meteor showers decrease in intensity? Yeah. Because the Earth's kind of knocked them out and dust is kind of scattered and stuff. Yeah, that's anyway, a good follow-up. That's a, yeah, in 100 years, I will I will get you the information you need to, <laughs> to, to that query that, that I threw out, <laughs> out out of nowhere. That's where my mind works. I'm like, ooh, that's a thought. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so meteor shower tonight. Take it out, 12, uh, 12 through 13th. And then if you don't see it tonight, keep an eye out closer to the end of the week so as, the, as the moon kind of, you know, it was a full moon on the 9th. So it'll be a little less light each night. You know, that percentage is going to drop off pretty quick. So closer to the 15th, that'll be the tail end you'll be able to see. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye out uh, Friday night if you have a chance. And send us any pictures. Send if us any pictures. Yeah, report it at kxan.com. Yes. But the meteor shower is not the only topic we have today right. of conversation. We are also talking about a space company expansion. Which company? Yes, yeah, so this is Cesium Astro. They are based in Travis County in Bee Cave. I got to visit their facility last week, and uh, here, take a look. Across a factory floor, telecommunications components are put together. Their ultimate destination, space. Birthed in a shopping center in Bee Cave, Texas, Cesium Astro has grown over eight years into a leading developer of telecommunications equipment. We're entering a generation uh, of uh, connectivity that is very different to what uh, we have been used to over the past uh, century. CEO Shea Sabrapour says the company will soon take a giant leap. We're building now the most advanced satellite spacecraft factory in the world, uh, in my opinion, in, in Austin. Their satellite, called Element, allows them to send targeted services to remote areas. The signal can be shaped and even move. It's about connecting advanced robotics, uh, factories, the warfighter to the sor source of the information in the most secure, resilient, low-latency, high-speed method possible. In May, the Texas Space Commission approved a $10 million grant for the company. Approximately $126 million has been approved to date. Texas Space Commission Executive Director Norman Garza said that since it started handing out money in 2023, 22 projects have received grants. Governor Abbott uh, and the team uh, around him are passionate about growing the uh, state economy, and space is a huge economy. That investment will grow in September. A new bill passed this session allocated more funds. $300 million in 2025. I couldn't be more honored by the trust that Texas Space Commission put in us uh, to expand our facility here. In Bee Cave, Eric Hendrickson, KXAN News. So sea stars, when they're looking healthy, um, have sort of 
puffy arms, they're, they're straight out, they might curl, like turn a bit. Um, but when they're sick, they start to sort of like curl back on themselves. So they look very twisty. Um, they get lesions um, that so you know, you can see what a lesion looks like on their surface. Um, and then their arms actually fall off and walk away. So it's pretty noticeable when it happens. And that first disease outbreak, uh, in particular, it hit sort of the sunflower stars, which they are, um, they seem to be some of our most susceptible ones. And, um, and we sort of had the, the huge losses. So they're now listed as critically endangered. We've lost over 90% of their population from uh, Mexico to Alaska, which is uh, over 5 billion sea stars, it might be over 6 billion. It's so many. So many that have mm -hmm. been lost already. And she mentioned that their legs kind of break off and just like wander away. Yeah, they just kind of like just kind of curl up and die. So scientists initially thought there was a bacteria in, or they thought there was a virus involved. Yeah. And the virus, because they're investigating a virus, they, were, they took them an extra length, long time to figure it out. And so during this time, you lose this population, right? This population feeds on sea urchins. Well, then the sea urchin population exploded. And as a result, 95% of the kelp forests are on the coast of Northern California mm -hmm. wiped out. Wiped out completely. Yeah, as a result, so you lose one species, another species then flourishes, and then it decimates another species. Mm -hmm. So this chain reaction is happening. So initially, yeah, they thought it was a virus. The scientists is that thought it was the virus. remainder of them? Is that like what they look like once they've yeah. died off? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's like a fresh one. Uh, so viruses initially thought it was a virus, or scientists thought it was a virus, and then they were like, no, this is a bacteria, and they discovered it was this bacteria that, apologize, I'm trying to pronounce a word, uh, colomic fluid. It was inside the colomic fluid, whatever that is, uh, and it killed them off. Uh, the, the bacteria is called Vibro pentacita. That's some Latin for you. I like to throw it out when I can. Uh, it's been known to affect scallops, but it's now linked to these sea stars. So uh, this is what the researchers said about having to discover what happened and how they found it and what, what this means. Yeah, let's hear that. So we did the we did the challenge experiments, looking um, we we're having our healthy sea stars and our and our wasting sea stars, and we were collecting um, salomic fluid samples throughout those experiments, which again is like the sea star blood, um, and then we used genomic data sets. Um, so we did a bunch of sequencing um, from those samples, and that's what allowed us to characterize all the different bacteria and viruses within those samples. And that's where we had first identified um, our pathogen, Vibrio pectinicida. Um, and then from there, we essentially um, collected salomic fluid from a wasting sea star, and then all of the culturing work to isolate the, that specific bacteria. What we've detected is essentially a new strain, which is kind of like a different genetic variant of an existing species. So the species Vibrio pectinicida as a whole had already been identified in the early 90s in France. Um, and it was isolated from scallop farms where they were seeing these mortality events. And so they were interested in isolating the bacteria responsible. And they showed that this Vibrio pectinicida can cause um, mortality in, in scallop and oyster larvae, which is kind of like the little seed that the bivalves grow from. Um, and so we're dealing with the same species with sea star wasting disease, but we haven't, we've characterized a novel strain here on the West Coast that's causing disease in sea stars. So it's a, it's, it's just a slightly different genetic variant. Wow. So they are on track and they know where this is yeah. coming from, why it's happening. So now they know what's killing them off. We can mm -hmm. find a solution, hopefully regrow the, or, you know, re populate the ocean, mm -hmm. increase the population of this species. So that's the first step when it comes to, to saving lives, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to do that soon. Again, as a result of the loss of these sea stars, a sea urchin population explosion led to 95% of the kelp dying off on Northern California's coast. That kelp is used as a home for other species and as food for other species. I was about so, to say that. chain it's reaction. Food. It's a chain reaction. Yeah. But now, and the sea stars are listed as critically endangered. Like I said, it's kind of like somewhere between a starfish and an octopus. They're kind of somewhere in the middle there. Multiple, they're kind of cute. <laughs> so, yeah, they're kind of cute. They're kind of cute. Uh, yeah, but hopefully this will lead to a boost in their population, and maybe we can see a little bit of the ocean restored. Yeah, and you know, um, scientists around the world have recreated dire wolves before. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that they can find a way to well, recreate something like that. And this. this species is still alive, so hopefully they can, you know, by Make giving them quicker. a, a yeah. vaccine... 
of some sort that can help prevent the, you know, it's, it's, it's a bacteria. So I guess you wouldn't need a vaccine. You need an antibiotic. Mm-hmm. Uh, use an Multiple. antibiotic on it. Yeah, and then you can hopefully save their life. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but that's some positive news that we lost. We were about to lose the species, and we found us. We found what's going on, and hopefully a solution will be in the coming. But, you know, see stars, and then we have some falling stars tonight. So don't forget yep. the Percy meteor shower is tonight meteor through, shower. through tomorrow. Stars. Moon is out, so it'll be hard to see, but you should be able to see some. If not, wait till the 15th. You'll be able to see some cold meteor showers, yeah. hopefully. And you have an article right now published yes. on our website. Can you tell us about that article? Yeah, it goes, goes in depth there? on to the meteor shower and what, what you can expect and where you're going to find it and kind of the history of it. A lot of things we talked about here and some nice photos in there just for fun. Mm-hmm. And then Some I'm working weeks. on a story for later today with even more information. So we'll, we'll, we'll drop that in that same story. Yes. And if anyone happens to catch the meteor shower on camera through their telescope or just wants to tell us you know, what it looked like. Report it cameras. Report it cameras. We catch every year. Mm. That's actually one of the best ways. So if you do catch it from your reported or not report camera, your uh, ring camera. Ring sorry. Cameras. And then send it to report it. <laughs> Send, you catch it on your ring camera, <laughs> send it to report it. We love that. We can put it on our, our, our air on KX. Yes. So report it at kxane.com is the email. Send the photos and videos there. Videos yeah, maybe great. we can talk about them next Tuesday too. Yes, yeah, we can show you a bunch. Mm-hmm. That'll be perfect. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining me, Eric. Yes, thank and you for we'll having me. See you next week. See you next week.